caffeine can give you energy. Mitochondrial support vitamins can also do the same thing. A 2023 observational study looking at 174 individuals with chronic fatigue after a COVID-19 infection were given either control, so this would be pain medications, yoga, and counseling was the control in this study, or they were given mitochondrial support, CoQ10 and alpha-lipoic acid, plus the control. And what they found was after two months, those receiving the mitochondrial supplement on top of the control interventions had a 50% reduction in fatigue, poor sleep, and in pain. I do feel mitochondrial supplements are an area where we need better research. So looking at something like this is, is quite helpful. And especially when given against a control group to compare the effects and, and to mitigate the impact of placebo. So if you've had an infection or otherwise, if you're struggling with fatigue, something to consider might be CoQ10 100 milligrams per day and alpha lipoic acid 100 milligrams per day also. Coming back to exercise, if you're someone who hasn't quite gained traction with exercising, this meta-analysis I think could be for you. They summarized 33 randomized control trials in just over 2,000 individuals with either fatigue or with other chronic conditions, autoimmune diseases, cancers, fibromyalgia, IBS. And this is what's interesting. They found the most effective intervention for fatigue was what's known as exer gaming. So game exercise, that was the most effective. Now, second to that was either cycling or a combination of aerobic and strength training. Either one led to the similar results of, of what's known as a moderate effect size. So cycling or aerobic plus strength, either one of these led to a moderate impact. But the extra gaming led to a large effect size, leading the researchers to conclude physical activity has a modest effect on fatigue amongst adults with chronic conditions. And where I think extra gaming is interesting, if you're someone who hasn't really taken up habitually the habit of exercise, it might be that you just don't like going to the gym and you get bored. And it may also be that if you do go to the gym or a walk or a run, you don't push yourself. And when we're playing games, it's easier to get wrapped up in the game and work harder without realizing it. And as someone who's played sports throughout my life, I can say, this is clearly when I work the hardest. So something to consider if you're not getting traction with exercise might be extra gaming. And then the final two studies bring us back to mood and stress, this time looking at the impact of meditation. 10,000 subjects with anxiety, sadness, and or stress were given a meditation app called Insight Timer. And they found that meditation was effective for improving either the anxiety, the sadness, and or the stress when people practiced it four to seven days per week. They didn't find that the length of the session had an impact. And this I think is very crucial. You'll sometimes hear someone say, oh, I meditate for 45 minutes per day. And my internal response to that is, boy, where do you find the time? And if you're someone who is being told, well, it's got to be 20 minutes. If it's not 20 minutes, it's not sufficient. And then you therefore don't meditate. You might miss the key finding from this fairly large study, which was consistency was more important than duration. And the four to seven days per week was, was the real mark to try to hit here. But again, not giving yourself a quota regarding time. And this leads to the researchers' comments. Our findings suggest that it was the consistency of practice, not the length of individual sessions, that was the most important predictor of change. One thing to keep in mind, and as I say with a diet, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So here that same thing would apply. And I just wanted to tie one concept to why it may have been those undergoing the insight timer meditation practice had improved sadness and, and stress and, and, and what have you. This comes from a 2014 clinical trial. And what they did was put people in a functional MRI before and then after meditation. And while they were in the MRI, they showed them startling images. In fact, I wanted to share one with you, but I wasn't sure if we'd get some sort of YouTube censorship. It's a person pointing a gun in your face, and it's, it's certainly unpleasant to look at. And here's what they found. The people who were practicing mindfulness meditation, when scanning their brains, there was a significantly lowered 
activation of their amygdala, a center in the brain that tends to overfunction when people are stressed and anxious. And what was elegant about this study in particular is they compared it to a control group. So half of the people practice mindfulness meditation, the other half didn't do anything. They get in the functional MRI, scan their brains while showing them these scary images, and they see a, a really noteworthy reduction in the fear governing center of the brain, the amygdala. So I just wanted to tie that in for you regarding one of the things happening in the brain that is beneficial when you meditate. So to round this all out in summary, there is a lot of power in your hands. Exercise as we covered can fully negate the negative impact of insufficient sleep and also improve your energy. Probiotics along with a multivitamin essentially can improve fatigue. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be more effective than monotherapeutic of medication. Mitochondrial support can improve your energy as CoQ10 and alpha-lipoic acid. And meditation can improve your mood and your brain health. So, so many great tools that you can use to improve your health. And I hope that these do improve your health and that you'll let me know about it in the comments. All right, guys, this is Dr. Ruscio. I will talk to you next time. <laughs>